This is the news conference of President Devon Woodland of the National Farmers Organization at its 25th National Convention. The scene is Kansas City at the historic Mulebach Hotel, just a block from the huge auditorium where the sessions will begin the next day. We go now to the speaker's podium where President Woodland is beginning the news conference. Uh, we're proud of the the uh, system that we have built, the uh, physical facilities we have now available to the farmers and ranchers. I think that we have uh, put together a system unequaled in the, in the country. Uh, we have a nationwide collection, dispatch, and delivery system. It's a system that uh, uh, reaches clear from California across uh, the country and then north and south. They're uh, livestock collection points. We have several hundred of those. We have dairy reloads where we uh, deliver our milk to. We have many of those. And then a grain accumulation point. So we've put together a network in this system that uh, gives the farmers an alternative to that uh, old system of marketing. And uh, we're all familiar with the, what that is. It's one that's owned by the industry. It's one where traditionally we have gone there with our supply of product and, and uh, said in effect, uh, well, what's the market today? What will you give me? And we had no alternative. And the National Farmers Organization, through its collective bargaining program, is giving the farmers an alternative to that system. Uh, we learned early in the organization that the answer to the farm problem was not in Washington. We used that approach for a period of time, and then we learned quickly that uh, our numbers uh, were of such that uh, our uh, desires were not uh, extracted from that source. We do maintain an office there uh, to protect farm legislation, but uh, we are not uh, optimistic about uh, farm legislation that would uh, uh, represent the needs of the farmers and ranchers. And so we know that uh, our power to get things done is in the food and fiber that we produce. And so we'll uh, concentrate on the collective bargaining and using uh, our production as our tool, we'll, we'll proceed with it. Now, uh, just last Thursday, I had the opportunity to meet with uh, the President, President Carter. Uh, we received an invitation to come into the White House, which we uh, did do. And as we visited with him, uh, he touched on several things that I think uh, uh, agriculture needs to take a look at. He seemed to be very knowledgeable of uh, agriculture. I was uh, genuinely uh, encouraged by seemingly his grasp of agriculture. But uh, he commented that uh, fuel efficiency in agriculture is uh, still uh, a problem. Uh, and that we need in agriculture to be more alert uh, as far as the uh, uh, fuel efficiency goes. Uh, and he pointed out some ways that this could be done. And he suggested the automotive industry has had a lot of pressure put on them. And in so doing, uh, they have a deadline on uh, bringing their mileage per gallon up. And then he suggested that we haven't put that type of pressure on agriculture yet, indicating that he has a genuine concern for uh, considering that as a possibility. He mentioned minimum tillage, and then he also mentioned the solar drying of crops that heretofore we have gone to the propane, the natural gas to do. I think these are some genuine things, uh, genuine points that uh, we may well consider. Uh, the points that I made with the President as we visited was is we're genuinely concerned about the transfer of land from this generation of farmers to the next generation. Uh, the young people uh, are faced with a crisis, really. Uh, we see the interest rates beginning to uh, become exorbitant to where it becomes a major production cost. Uh, we see fuel continuing to escalate with projections that it uh, may go higher by midsummer to as much as a dollar twenty dollar and a quarter a gallon. Uh, we uh, listen to projections by uh, some of the economists that farm income, net farm income, would decline as much as twenty percent 
and that uh, production costs would uh, increase 30 percent. And of course, these uh, uh, really uh, put the young farmer and those who are attempting to get started at a disadvantage. And so our concern was the transfer of land from this generation to the other. And if these things are allowed to become a reality, then in fact what happens is that we've just closed the doors on the young people. And uh, the thing that makes this country great, always has made this country different and great, is that we have had ownership of the soil. We have been participants in saying, this is my country, this is my farm, this is my home. And uh, we're seeing that slip away from us to where the private ownership in most of the major businesses we used to have the family ownership, and we've seen it slip away from everything but agriculture, and now we see it slipping away from agriculture. So we become deeply concerned when we see this happening. And the President asked uh, what uh, we felt needed to be done to halt this, and I suggested we need to restructure agriculture. The policies and programs restructure those uh, we have been uh, living with farm programs that were put together as much as 40 years ago. They're outdated, they're outmoded, and in many cases, as we patch and try to put Band-Aids on that uh, uh, agricultural program, we uh, leave a gap somewhere where somebody will slip in with uh, tax loss farming, uh, another, they'll take advantage of uh, some of the programs in agriculture. So. We suggest that he restructure. Now, there's a danger in restructuring if you have the wrong people involved in the restructuring process. And we pleaded with him to let us become a part of the restructuring uh, uh, program and that the main theme needed to be who do we really want owning and operating the food production of this country? And I submit that we want the individual, the private ownership, uh, the uh, uh, owner-operator concept versus the absentee owner, the foreign investor. And that uh, our program, through collective bargaining, uh, uh, really is the only alternative that we have. We don't have another uh, alternative to protecting agriculture as uh, far as the individual is concerned. So, these are the things that we did talk about, and uh, on account of uh, farm credits by Iran, uh, what's, what's your feeling? What's NFO's uh, policy on that? Well, we're always concerned about our export markets. We're jealous about them. We would like to take and and uh, maintain those, but uh, if the president feels that it's in the best interest of this country that uh, there be a food boycott of uh, Iran for the good of the hostage as well as uh, the good of the country, we will support him in it. Uh, of course, it will take much more than just a boycott by this country. It will take a boycott by others, because as we sell food to other countries through a conduit, uh, no question but what it would get back to them. So it will take a further boycott than just the United States. He's currently holding a series of uh, talks around the country uh, assessing uh, uh, the nation's foreign policy. I was wondering whether you could uh, comment on your feelings about uh, um, about that, about whether you sense uh, uh, any real changes coming out of those uh, uh, these policy uh, discussions right now. Yes, I do. He has been genuinely interested in getting ideas and suggestions. Uh, he's uh, in the process of holding this, these meetings. We have been in all the meetings. Our people in the geographic areas where he holds uh, have been assigned to go in and present constructive ideas. Uh, I know that he's under a lot of criticism by groups that are uh, attending the meetings. And uh, if you have something better to offer than what's in existence, then you have a right to criticize. But to just be negative and to be critical of what exists, I think it's unfortunate that uh, people would take that approach. So we're trying to be very objective about it, and we have presented uh, our views on uh, foreign investment, on corporate agriculture, uh, and uh, again, we're calling on him to restructure agriculture. 
and uh, let us be a participant in that uh, in that development. Ideas on what uh, what could be done to help the young farmer, uh, number one, and also what could be done to narrow uh, the competitive edge of large farming enterprises over uh, the traditional family farms. The young farmer has a real problem in establishing himself in this industry. Uh, land values are uh, estimated, uh, projected that they could well triple by 1990. Uh, the 20% uh, projected interest now at 15 and a quarter. Uh, the projected interest uh, would uh, create an extreme operating cost for him. And then we even have the question in our minds as to whether there will be enough of the 20% money available. Uh, I think there has to be uh, another look at programs that gives him some ability to retire the debt he incurs. Now, uh, it's not going to happen in Washington. Uh, we will have uh, uh, some assist through the FHA program. There will be some s assist with price support programs. But these are just minimum needs. And in order to go from that minimum need up to a return on his investment and uh, to receive his cost of production, it's going to take a different approach than government. And those in government who are uh, open will tell you that they, uh, they can't solve that problem. And this means then that it's going to be up to the farmer and come right back to he and his organization. And of course, we believe the principle of collective bargaining has treated all people in various segments of society uh, well. And as we introduce that program and become deeper involved in it, uh, we think we have the only solution, the only assist for this uh, energetic young man who would like to become a part of the industry, the uh, agriculture industry. Uh, Secretary Bergman, at the uh, meeting in Sedalia last week, made the comment that in analyzing and holding these meetings around the country, they may find that in some cases the big farms, the uh, specialization is really the answer rather than the problem uh, for agriculture. What's your feelings on this? Well, I suppose you'd have to define what you call the big farm. We're talking about uh, corporations versus family corporations. Uh, I think it would be a, a drastic mistake for the big corporate type farm to get control of the food production in this country. We have seen it happen in other industry, and the American people are really the losers uh, because the large corporations will not operate at cost of production plus a reasonable return. I think we've seen the corporations operate in areas where they take absorbent profits. And uh, I think the most uh, economical way, uh, the most economic unit, is a family operated unit, a family corporation or partnership, and that they will be fair not only with uh, the market but with the consumers and can continue to supply to this country and to the world the variety of food, the best quality of food that there, there is available. What would you suggest uh, as ways? It's getting back to an earlier question I asked, and I'm not sure perhaps maybe you didn't hear the second part of it. I was just wondering, uh, do you have any specific suggestions on, on what could be done, uh, again, to, uh, to narrow the, uh, the competitive edge that the large corporate farms have over uh, uh, you know, the small uh, family farmers? Well, they have uh, uh, tax advantages. I think uh, that needs to be taken away from them. They have off-the-farm income coming in to subsidize the farming operation. Uh, I think these uh, uh, tax loss farming needs to be taken uh, a very close look at and uh, uh, then I think uh, if there were inheritance tax uh, restructuring uh, where the uh, passing of the land from father to son uh, would give him some advantage over what now exists and the president assured us 
that this is under consideration and may well come out of Congress in the next year. Every now and then we see uh, in the news that uh, some state legislature or perhaps uh, some congressional committee is concerned with alien ownership of American land or alien purchases. Is this uh, a separate problem or is this part of the general problem of non-farm uh, moving in on agriculture? This is happening much more rapidly than uh, is suspected. Uh, the percentage, of course, is small, but the percent of land trading hands or changing hands, then the percentage becomes something to be concerned about. The total percentage is not that alarming, but as we now take a look at the age of the American farmer, which is 58 plus years old, this means then in the next five, six, eight years, that's going to be a retirement age, and that land will change ownership. And if it cannot be maintained by the true bona fide farmer and rancher, it then becomes available to uh, outside money, speculator, or those who are uh, attempting to position themselves for uh, inflated land values and uh, return on investment. Uh, I think this is the only country in the world that I know of that uh, we allow a foreign country to come in and buy uh, the basic industry. Uh, you don't go into another foreign country and uh, buy their basic industry. And agriculture is the basic industry of this country. It's uh, the backbone of our country. It's a thing that we're known worldwide to excel in. Uh, nobody can boast, as we can, of our ability to supply the needs of people with food and fiber. And I think Congress must act and uh, close that gap that allows foreign interests to come in and get control of such a vital industry as uh, food and fiber. Do you have a, a strong feeling uh, in Congress on behalf of uh, farmers on that issue and, and generally on other farm-related uh, issues? Uh, We've since testified in front of the committees, uh, uh, Senator Bayh's committee on uh, corporate and foreign investment into agriculture. Uh, we're gaining momentum on it. Uh, we're gaining understanding, and I think that's what you have to have first. Uh, I think that uh, as we pursue it and continue to build support and uh, awareness of this danger, we will. I don't look for it to happen immediately, but uh, we have a good start. We introduced the, uh, the bill some uh, four or five years ago, and now we do have some support building for it. Some of the state laws merely require a disclosure or reporting. Do you think that this is adequate? Well, uh, many of the, much of this reporting is after the fact. Uh, I can recall the Department of Agriculture testifying that they had a reporting system where they were keeping track of this happening, that in fact, uh, as it happened, uh, people had to come in and report their purchase. Well, this is after the fact. Uh, we think that they ought to apply uh, for permission to do it and then have it uh, uh, become public knowledge that this, in fact, is happening. So reporting is fine if it's uh, uh, not after the fact. Uh, uh, currently, where is that in, uh, in Congress? Are there, what, several bills uh, pending on that? Uh, I wasn't aware that it was in the, uh, in the process until the President mentioned that uh, they had talked about it and uh, it had merit and they were going to uh, pursue it and hopefully that they would have some action on it. Uh, so I'm anxious to see uh, just where and what it consists of. Do you know generally what any, any bits and pieces of what it over basis of inheritance tax assessment. As the law now stands, uh, when a young couple inherits a farm, if they dispose of it, they have to pay capital gains back to the time 
and the father got it. Uh, when you repeal the carryover basis, they can inherit a farm at its current value and will only be liable to tax on the increments in value after they inherited it. <coughs> and that's the principal legislative fight that's going on in relation to the conveyance of land from one generation to the next. It is going to pass. It's quite clear. As I recall it's through the House now and, and up the Senate and will pass. That definitely uh, has advantages. Mm -hmm. We go back to the uh, Iranian situation and the calls that uh, a number of organizations are uh, giving for a food boycott. Uh, what are NFO's uh, uh, positions on that? And are you actually uh, pushing ahead with any kind of plans to impose a food boycott against Iran? Uh, I think it's a, a, a mistake. I think it's a gross error for those of us to stand on the sidelines and, and call the plays uh, on international issues when our knowledge is confined generally to domestic and agriculture issues. And when we get into the political process, that's someone else's field of expertise. And uh, we will support the president, keeping in mind that the interests of the hostages and the uh, the good of the country and he and his advisors make that decision and we will stand behind him on that decision in other words if he decides to impose a boycott that would include food nfo would back it that's right we would support the president in his decision uh, when we talk about uh, embargoes uh, of course if embargoes are a domestic embargo to influence the price the domestic markets on grain, cattle, whatever it be, we would be opposed to an embargo that would affect the domestic markets. But when it comes to international issues dealing with the well-being of people, uh, this becomes a decision for the president and his advisors, and uh, we'll support them. Do you think your other farming group colleagues have made a mistake by coming out and calling for this kind of action? I think that they were uh, in somebody else's uh, area of responsibility. In your remarks, prepared remarks here, you talk about uh, the future uh, financially of farms and predictions for farm income and interest rates, et cetera. Can you summarize that again? What do you see as the outlook financially for uh, uh, farmers in America, not only the interest rates they have to pay, but uh, gasoline and just the overall income that they'll derive from their crops? Well, we have received the projections from the Department of Agriculture that net farm income may well during the year 1980 uh, decline 20 percent. And of course, uh, part of this would be because of the high cost of fuel, taxes, uh, interest. Uh, and uh, this uh, would uh, be a projected increase in production costs of 30 percent. Uh, this is going to become a major operating cost for any farm unit. And then there's even question as to whether interest will stop at uh, the level it is now projected that it may even reach 20 percent, that fuel may well reach a uh, dollar and uh, 20 cents per gallon. All of these become major input costs. And so as you now uh, operate your farm with an attempt to uh, return to yourself cost of production, it becomes uh, an extreme burden, particularly with markets that are uh, uncertain, that uh, are determined by someone else. And the only way to deal with that issue is to position yourself where the markets can be determined by those who manufacture food. And everybody in the country uh, who manufactures uh, an item, they establish the value. And in agriculture, as we manufacture uh, food and fiber, we turn that determining factor over to somebody else. And no business can operate by allowing that to happen very long. And so now we as an organization are determined to uh, establish our right to price because we are the manufacturers and in so doing uh, we can give some protection and establish uh, an economic climate that would attract and protect and we think it has to be collective bargaining with a very firm 
tough but fair position. You don't think the uh, open competitive market system is working? It hasn't worked for 50 years. You have a handful of buyers that are easily organized among themselves. And uh, there's no question but what, uh, when the price of steel is announced by one company, a few days later the next company announces it, and the first thing within uh, a week or so they have all. The same with, way with the automobile industry. There's no question but what uh, the free market is uh, something that does not work anymore. Why would any young boy going out, going into college, uh, wanting to study courses, why would he even want to be a farmer today? With the, with the, the things that he's facing. Uh... Well, it's a challenge for him. It's like any business, any industry. You have a, a knack or a desire to become a doctor, lawyer, whatever it is. And these young men who have been attached to the soil, many of them who have not, would like to. And so they pursue that course and uh, with all the vigor and enthusiasm of a young man, and then when they become confronted with the ruthless market structure that we have, it dampens their spirit. And uh, our fear is, is down the road uh, with uh, the trends and the climate that is now there, these young people won't be able to stay. And then who will be uh, producing the food for the country? Uh, we uh, hesitate to think that it may move into uh, corporate and stock companies like we have seen all other industries move in. If it does, as I mentioned earlier, if it does, we're all the losers. You gave a prediction regarding uh, farm income, looking at your crystal ball as far as prices from the consumer level that we'll be paying uh, this next year or in the immediate future. What do you foresee there for different, uh, different crops and uh, different uh, uh, farm products? I think that the consumer will have to pay more for food. I think that uh, it will increase a percentage. Uh, I know that as we position ourselves to become the source of markets and uh, involved in deciding the thinking about that you would classify as the, the traditional concept of, of the family farm as opposed to corporate and other large uh, uh, farm holders. Do you know what the numbers are and whether just how much they've been declining, whether that decline is, is steadied out over the uh, last talked, year or so? Uh, in numbers of uh, 2.5 million farm units in the United States. Uh, this would be uh, encompassed in uh, all the commercial farms. And then, of course, there's the smaller hobby farmer that would not be included in that number, but 2.5 million, 2 plus. Oh. Yes, we certainly do. We uh, have our projections five years ahead. Uh, right now, as an organization, we're uh, handling uh, about $700 million in cash flow through the organization. We have set our sights with each of our departments in dairy, meat, and grain on a percent of growth during the next 12 months to $1.5 billion. And then uh, that same percentage of growth uh, that we uh, have considered needed and important will move us into a five billion dollar organization in the next five years. Uh, we think this is very realistic. We, f we feel that the first 12 months will be a, uh, the slowest in coming. We have to uh, establish a confidence in the organization, in the uh, programs, which is now coming. And once that confidence is established that we do have the system, uh, we do have the personnel, we have all that's needed, then we believe it will grow very rapidly. We are uh, updating our computer system. We're uh, putting online computers in all of our geographic areas across the United States that will operate much like the airlines uh, that have a central computer, and then all the ticket counters across the country can punch in and pull off information from the, uh, the central computer. Uh, they will be able to deal uh, with the check writing. Uh, will be done in the field off of the, uh, the uh, inline computers. We'll have central control, uh, but we'll also have uh, 
the ability to reach and deal with the uh, markets, the issues, the movement of commodity in uh, all geographic areas. You mentioned uh, there's a question of, of confidence uh, right now. Uh, where, uh, what's the reason? What has resulted in that? Uh, uh, members Basically questioning the, that. Uh, the atmosphere in the country uh, has uh, escalated. Uh, the atmosphere in the country. I think perhaps there's several factors in this. The primary one being uh, the farmer is uh, business-minded and oriented. Uh, he sees the need of uh, group action. He sees the helplessness of he as an individual. Uh, they're used to group action. The uh, older farmer uh, has been opposed to a group action approach. The uh, 20, 30, middle 40-year-old farmers and ranchers have grown up around it all their life, and they know it works. And so they're wanting to see if we can really do what we profess we can, and as we prove to them we can, uh, their confidence is going to build. We're seeing uh, a phenomenal growth in the organization. Uh, for every renewal in membership, and uh, the renewal percentage is good, high. For every renewal, we're getting one and a half new members into the organization, which, uh, of course, is important to us, but more important is the commodity that they have, because that's where our strength is at, is in commodity. We're a commodity organization versus a membership organization by, like many. membership will uh, lead to the uh, the growth in your in your cash uh, uh, cash flow no that five million dollar figure we're, we're extremely optimistic and I try to be a realist but uh, all indications are that the farmers and ranchers are now ready to do what we talked about for so long in uh, as a principle in collective bargaining we used to have to defend ourselves we used to have to sell the idea we debated the issue of whether or not it was uh, morally right and if it would work. And now we see all farm organizations talking about collective bargaining as the future in agriculture. And uh, with the 25 years of experience we have had, uh, we feel that uh, we are the professionals in that field. We know how. We know what has to be done. We know how to make the markets react. And it's farm bargaining, uh, farmer bargaining is what uh, uh, will make it